Hi, Wesley. <laughs> 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13. We're all here. Uh, so today, we will continue on talking about electric potential and maybe get to some capacitors. So first, looking just at this figure, it has two pieces put together. One is showing two plates that we actually call a capacitor, having those two plates that are parallel to each other is your classic capacitor. And you have a positive charge on one plate and a negative charge on the other. <clears throat> if I put a positive charge between those plates, it's going to be repelled by positive and attracted by negative, right? Because opposites attract and likes repel. And so its potential energy is going to go down as it moves toward the negative plate. The picture down below is showing an analogy if I have a ball on a slope. It has a higher potential energy at the top of the slope and lower potential energy at the bottom. The reason for this picture is to help us get in our minds the relationship between electric potential, electric potential energy, and just regular old potential energy. The charged particle is naturally going to go to its lowest potential energy state. Since a positive is attracted to negative, it's going to naturally go toward negative because that's lower potential energy. If it's a negative charge, Negative is attracted to the positive, it's going to naturally go to positive because that's a lower potential energy. And we're going to learn today how to calculate the difference in energy this charge is going to have. Notice the equation up here. The change in potential energy is equal to <clears throat> the change in kinetic energy. That comes from change in energy equals zero because, that's a C, electric force is conservative. So change in energy is equal to change in kinetic energy plus change in potential energy. And there's a minus sign missing in that equation. I didn't write the equation. I can't take credit for that mistake. It should be that way, right? Because the potential energy goes down, the kinetic energy goes up. That's what it should have had for both of these equations. So let's ask a question related to what I just said. If I have a point charge, is it going to go to a position of lower potential energy or higher potential energy? You can answer the question identically by saying if I have a ball, is it going to go to lower potential energy or higher potential energy when I release it? It's going to go to lower. So the correct, correct question is going to lower potential energy. What about electric potential? Now the ball doesn't really make sense because it has no electric charge. If I have a positive charge, is it going to go toward a lower electric potential? What's the other name for electric potential? Voltage, despite what the textbook might have been trying to argue. So is, the, is a positive charge going to go to lower voltage or higher voltage? Lower. Why is it going to go to lower voltage? Because opposites attract. So negative charge is lower voltage, and a positive is going to go toward that negative charge toward the lower voltage. So positive moves to lower electric potential, while a negative charge would move to a higher electric potential because... Once again, opposites attract. The negative charge has a lower potential energy when it's close to the high voltage or the high charge. Electric field points in the direction of decreasing voltage because the electric field is pointing in the direction the force is going to be on a particle. And if the particle moves due to the force, well, I should be clear. The electric field points in the direction the force will be on a positive charge. And if the charge moves parallel to the force, then it's going to lower potential energy. So that's why electric field points in the direction of decreasing voltage. A first problem, we start off real quick. Five minutes in, we're going to do a problem. A battery-powered lantern is switched on for five minutes. So delta T is equal to five minutes. 
During this time, the electrons with a total charge of, I just moved the C over, minus 8.0 times 10 to the 2 coulombs, otherwise known as Q equals minus 800 coulombs. And 9,600 9, joules of electric potential energy is converted to light and heat. So I have the change in potential energy is equal to 9,600 joules. Then the question is, through what potential difference, what voltage difference do the electrons move? How does potential energy, charge, and potential difference how do those relate? Or to put it another way, what is the definition for change in electric potential? Delta V is defined as Change in potential energy over charge. Now, you might have noticed while I was talking, I changed the sign of change in potential energy to give it a minus 9,600 joules. I gave it a minus 9,600 joules because energy goes out of the electric and into light and heat. So it's minus because the direction the energy is going. That was kind of a subtle thing. I felt I should point it out since I kind of made my mark subtly. So now I just put in the numbers. Change in potential energy minus 9600 joules, the charge minus 800 coulombs, 96 divided by 8 is 100. joules per coulomb. How do we usually write that? It's a volt. A joule per coulomb is a volt. So this is your typical 12-volt battery, a car battery, at work. So I am guessing when you looked at this, it looked a little confusing. But it turned out that it was a very trivial calculation. What's confusing is making sure we have locked into our minds what electric potential means that the change in electric potential is defined as the change in electric potential energy per charge. Any questions about this calculation? TJ. Um, what exactly is the difference between the voltage and the potential energy in terms of like definitions? Okay. It seems like the same thing. Put it in simple terms. The voltage is the potential energy per unit charge. Okay. Right. So if you have a high voltage, if you have more charge, you have more potential energy. By the way, we're doing electricity. I'm keeping my left hand in my pocket. If you're working with high voltage, that's one of the best safety things you can do. Because then you're not going to have a connection across your heart. And we'll talk about that later in today's, I, well, we'll maybe. Depends on how quickly I lecture. Okay, for a point charge, we had the equation that potential energy for point charge was K Q1 Q2 over R. And since voltage is change in potential energy over charge, then we say using a reference point of potential energy is zero as R approaches infinity, because that's what this equation would give us, and infinite as R approaches zero, then the change in voltage will allow me to say the voltage is equal to this, and thus for a point charge, just divide out the lowercase q. And the voltage due to a point charge is kq over R. This is, maybe surprisingly to you, something that's very nice. We talked about electric fields, and you had to do a problem or two where you had to calculate the electric field at some location due to multiple charges. 
When you did that calculation, you had to calculate the magnitude of the electric field due to each charge, and then you had to break the vector into its components and add the components separately. This here doesn't have a vector sign. Voltage is a scalar, there's no direction, which makes life oh so much easier. Because if I want to find the voltage of the location, I just add up the different voltages as scalars. No directions necessary. So the adding process is much simpler. For that reason, physicists really love to use voltage rather than electric fields. Because they fundamentally give you the same information. There is a calculation with calculus that allows you to go from voltage to electric field. And it's much easier to do the work in voltages because they're scalars. So if I have multiple charges, I just add them as scalars. I just said this. So let's do a problem again. So now I have three point charges and I'm asked to find the electric potential at point A here due to the three charges. I need to give myself another sheet of paper to do the work. So what is my method going to be to find the voltage, the electric potential right there? This is a scalar, so I don't need to. That's the beauty. So what do I do? I add KQ over R for each one. So I have this one here has R1 is equal to 2 centimeters. This one here has R3 is equal to, that's square root of 2 squared is 4, plus 1 is 5, square root of 5 centimeters squared. And this one here has R2 equals square root of 2 centimeters squared. Pythagorean theorem again. And then I just say, And then I just have to do my work. So going to the next slide. I'm going to have to go back and forth because I don't remember anything. Q1 is 4 microcoulombs. Over R1 was 2.0 centimeters. Q2 is 2 coulomb, 2 microcoulombs. Um, okay, is one, oh, no, one is two centimeters. Yeah, no, I meant Oh, yes, you, you were. Yeah, I was just trying to help with that. Yeah, I see. I'm going to, I'm going to put 2.0 in the square root and then centimeters outside the square root. And I should put in what k value is. Why is the bottom being square rooted? Um, because I used the Pythagorean theorem. I had, change color here. This one here was 1 and 1. So R2 is the square root of 1 centimeter squared plus 1 centimeter squared. One plus one is two, hence the two. This one here was square root of two centimeters squared plus one centimeter squared. Two squared is four plus one, five. 
And so there's my calculation. Let's actually get a number to this. What is that number? Three over square root of five, I can't do in my head. <laughs> two point two four is the square root of five. Oh. Sorry, that's what you were asking. So three over two point two four then. So we put those all together. Yeah. 2.07 times So I get 1.86 million volts. Is that what you get? So there we found the voltage at point A. Now point charge of 5.0 newton um, nanocoulombs moves from a great distance to point A. What is the change in electric potential energy? It was five, right? Moves from very far away means it starts with a voltage of zero. So it starts with a voltage of zero, ends with a voltage of 1.86 times 10 to the sixth volts. What is the change in potential energy? Actually, times charge. Times charge because change in voltage was change in potential energy over charge. So now I'm going to calculate this. So I'm going to have equals 1.86 times 10 to the 6 volts minus, oh, nice job. My <clears throat> palm hit something. Minus 0, that's my change in voltage. Final voltage minus initial voltage. Multiply by the charge. Minus 5.0 times 10 to the minus 9 coulombs. And we just take this 1.86. 6, 9. Difference there is going to be minus 3. And 5. And what is a volt times a coulomb? Don't forget the minus sign right there. What's a simple way of writing a volt times a coulomb? You started right. 
Remember, a volt is a joule per coulomb times a coulomb. It's just equal to minus 9.16 times 10 to the minus 3 joules. So that's the change in the potential energy for that charge. Its change in potential energy went down. What else corresponded to its change in potential energy going down? Just think about the bowling ball pendulum. Potential energy goes down, the kinetic energy goes up. So its kinetic energy is going to go up by this amount. So if it started at rest, it would have this for its final kinetic energy, but positive. So now we can start to see how electric forces play out in making things move. It's still a force, and a force, anything that pushes or pulls, is going to cause accelerations as dictated by Newton's second law. And we're using the energy formalism now instead of the Newton second law formalism because in most cases, the energy formalism is easier for us. So we have a speed calculation, or if we know the mass of speed, but a kinetic energy determination from the information that was given. So do we have questions about how I went through this problem? No questions that I'm going to ask a few. How is it that I found the total voltage at point A? What was the method for finding the total voltage at point A? Just find it from each point charge and add them together as scalars. So it was much easier than it was if we did it for a vector. So that's why we like this, because it's easier to do that. And then we use that relationship between potential energy and charge to calculate the change of potential energy and going from infinitely far away to point A. Now what if, now just looking at the picture, I'm going to erase everything here. Maybe. What if we asked about point B? How would I find the, the voltage at point B? Yeah, same process, just different R. So I can do it pretty quick. And then if this is a positive, or, okay, this was positive, right? I think it was, yeah. If, if B is more positive, is the particle going to be attracted to B from A or repelled from B? Remember, it's a negative charge. It would be attracted if it's more positive. And when it gets there, what would have happened to its kinetic energy? It would have, it would have increased because it went to a place that was more attractive. Now, we use this in a lot of things, but first I've got an example that's, that's really kind of cool. We've learned about conductors. Remember in a conductor, the electrons, some of the electrons, not all of them, are fairly free to move. And so the electrons will reposition themselves so that the electric field inside a conductor is always zero. Now, if the electric field is zero, how much is the potential energy going to change as an electron moves through a region with zero electric field. How much work is done if there's zero electric field that moves? None. So if an electron moves within a conductor, there's no change in electric field. There's no electric field, excuse me, I'm getting to the answer. There's no electric field, so there's no change in energy, hence What's the change in voltage if there's no change in potential energy? Zero. So you're going to have the voltage doesn't change as you move through a conductor. So here's a graph showing if I have a spherical conductor, 
the voltage as I get closer, this is following KQ over R, and we get to the value at the surface, and then the voltage stays constant, no change in voltage, because the potential energy is not changing. The electric field, this is KQ over R squared for the magnitude of the electric field, but when you get inside, that drops to zero. So the graphs have a similarity in look, one's one over R and one's one over R squared, but then when you get to the surface, the voltage doesn't change when you cross the surface, and it's going to stay constant while you're going through the sphere because no change in energy with no electric field, whereas the electric field dropped to zero. Now we get to talk about some biology stuff. Now, how many people here are more interested in biology than physics? All right. That's, that's only a little more than half, which actually makes me feel good because usually a lot of people are more interested in biology. So our bodies are basically running on electricity. There's electrical interactions in lots of things. Um, you have a the voltage inside the cell and the voltage outside the cell are different. And that makes it so you can have ions go one direction, but not the other direction. Um, <clears throat> it's due to the concentrations of ions in the fluids. And this is especially something we pay attention to when we talk about nerves and muscles, things that very clearly run on electricity. So with nerves, an electric signal passes through the nerve, and you can see there's a potential spike as the signal goes through a nerve. So if you, <laughs> if you get electric sparks going through your body, You'll feel it because that's going to excite the nerves and it can make the nerves make bad things happen, you know, like well, all kinds of bad things. So notice here, this is a measurable voltage here when the nerve signal passes through that's on the order of 50 millivolts. That's, of course, milli means thousand. So 0 0.05 volts. It's a small voltage, but it's something that we can measure. Now let's get to the thing I love. <laughs> I love talking about the heart. You know, as an EMT, we had to learn all about the heart. I love that my iPhone will now do an EKG. Anyone who has a, the new iPhone, you can do an EKG with your phone, which is really cool. So I can look at mine, I can see it has a normal sinus rhythm. I looked at my dad's. I'm actually gonna show you a picture of my dad's EKG. I know that's probably a violation, right? But uh, well, you didn't sign me contracts. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I like the way you think, sir. <laughs> what, what I can say for sure is, Dad is definitely not going to sue me for showing you his um, his heart thing. <laughs> Assuming I can find it, cardiogram. It's not cardiogram. It's in the health app of all the things. It's not in the watch app. It's in the health app. How many people actually have? a watch that can do an EKG. All right, just me. Okay. Where is it? Health data, heart. No, you're just not aware that you're still. Oh man, I should have, I should have put, pulled this up before because I'm not finding it now. I'm not gonna spend any more time. I do have, <laughs> I do have them on here somewhere, but now I can't find them. Sorry. Well, my dad has a pacemaker, and so his looks very different, which is why I was going to show you. Let's talk about how the heart works and how we can use physics to measure what's going on. So first of all, the heart is a big old muscle, right? It's a muscle, and just like the old guns right here, it will contract and squeeze, or it will relax. And... We have the depolarization is when the muscle contracts. The repolarization is when it is returning to its ready-to-run state. And so we put probes on your body. And I know I said this last semester, some people were not familiar 
the, the very basic picture is here. So you have white on the right. Okay. White on the right. And then you have smoke over fire. Those are the basic three leads. If you're only putting three leads or three wires, if you're only putting three wires on a patient. This is showing a fourth wire for the right leg. We use these for a standard EKG. Like when I was in the back of the rig, our defibrillator would do an EKG and we hook them up like this, except for we only use those three. <laughs> if you go to the hospital and you get a 12 lead, they hook up all of these wires. How many people have had that? Oh yeah, I have. The, the 12 lead EKG. My class. One of the really bad things is if you're a man who has a hairy chest, they shave it. And then you have the nasty bald patches. And then when it grows in, it itches. And anyway, um, I have uh, blood clots in my lung history. And that's why I had to do a bunch of this stuff. So they put these on. Notice I said 12 leads. How many wires is that? Six. How do you get 12 leads out of six wires? They, they, a lead is in medical terminology. There's one lead. Here's another lead. Here's another lead. It's any comparison between two. And so with six wires, you can get a lot more than six comparisons. And each one they consider a lead. So that's one of the things I always thought, you know, in, in physics, a wire we consider a lead. I had 12 leads. How come you didn't put all 12 of them on? Now, I am an amateur. I used to be an EMT. And as an EMT, we used to actually look at the heart pattern to determine if it was a shockable rhythm or not. I've forgotten which ones are shockable, which ones are not. So it's probably good that I no longer practice an EMT or that today with the electric defibrillators, they intentionally don't show you the pattern. It's just analyzed on board and it tells you what to do. That removes human error. Because, you know, if you shock this, I was talking to some people in lab yesterday. What are you trying to do when you shock a person with a defibrillator? You're hoping that happens, but that's not what you're trying to do. Which would be going back to restarting it. But first, you're stopping it. When you shock a person with that defibrillator, your goal is to stop their heart. And then you hope that the body restarts it properly. And so you don't want to take something that has normal sinus rhythm and stop their heart for them. It's not helping them. Also, when you put these large voltages through the heart, you are going to cause some scarring. And that's not good either. So let's talk about what this rhythm shows. I don't think I have another one, so we'll just zoom in on this. Anyone here familiar with reading an EKG? You are, DJ? Well, yeah, we did it for EMT. Yeah, that's where I learned it too. So you have, okay, can you name the pieces or should I just run with it? Uh, like P, or P, I exactly. Okay, there's P. I, know the, I think the Q one's really It's good. alphabetical. And we just call this one here the QRS complex. At our level, we don't break it down, right, TJ? It's just the QRS complex. And then you have, finally, the straggler, the T wave. Right? So it's – Ryan's like, I knew this stuff. As soon as he said alphabetical order, I figured it out. <laughs> but what do these mean? Right? they got to mean something. So if we look at the heart, my EMT teacher – was quite the artist. Here's the heart. That does that look like a heart? It's, it's just as close as this is, okay? It, yeah, it squared the edges of something that's kind of abnormally shaped. So we have the top parts are called the atria. 
If you're old school, you can call them the oracles, A-U-R-I-C-L-E-S. That's the old school name for them. The atria are chambers that collect blood. Um, I should have drawn an additional thing right there. Everybody knows you've got the superior and inferior vena cava, or however you want to pronounce it, vena cava, where blood flows in to the heart. And so it goes in here, and the, the deoxygenated blood goes into the right atrium. So the right atrium, deoxygenated blood. And then you have valves. Who can correct me on my valves? Yeah, I'm just drawing three cusps. <laughs> it's the tricuspid valve there. So when you have the atrium, the right atrium pump, it's going to pump blood through that tricuspid valve into the right ventricle. Similarly, on the other side, you have the bicuspid, otherwise known as the mitral valve, because if you look at the Pope's hat, that's called a mitre, and it's got two cusps. So you've got the mitral valve, and when the left atrium pumps, it's going to push blood into the left ventricle. That's the beginning of the process. There's two other things. There's a pulmonary artery and the aorta. The pulmonary artery is an artery that goes from the right ventricle, ventricle to the lungs. And that's supposed to be a low pressure artery. It's the only artery in the body that has deoxygenated blood flowing through it. It's an artery because it's leaving the ventricle going out to the body, but it's just going to the lungs. And then from the lungs, okay, so my heart is taking the position of the lungs, we'll have oxygenated blood that comes in through the pulmonary vein. What? Okay, yeah, I know. Let me erase that heart. Okay, so your lungs are something like that. I don't know. I'm not an artist. You've got a bunch of lobes. Trivial fact, only three quarters of my lungs work. Because of the pulmonary emboli, it caused me to have lack of perfusion to the lungs, and hence they die. And the more you talk about this, the more serious it sounds. <laughs> it, it is really distress, distressing because my stamina has never been the same. But if you look at Lance Armstrong, he had cancer. He had a similar amount of lung removed, and then he went on to take steroids and win the Tour de France a number of times. <laughs> but yeah, I mean, that's right. If I pump myself full of steroids, I'll be good as gold. But he had great lung capacity with about the same amount of diminished function. So I shouldn't complain. But I do because I'm a whiner. Okay, so the last step then is the aorta. You have the arch of aorta taking the blood out. Whoops. <laughs> I just accidentally did split screen again. I don't know how. Oh, look, there's a picture of the heart. See, that's what the heart really looks like. Doesn't mine look similar? Yeah. I mean, you've got the tricuspid here, the bicuspid there. You've got the superior and inferior vena cavas, pulmonary vein, pulmonary art. It's all there. Okay, so stick with my picture. How does this work with the electrical signals, right? This is a physics class, not an anatomy class. Well, it starts with, I almost need to rewrite my heart. I'm going to redraw my heart. So redrawing my heart. Here's the heart. The body sends a signal to the heart to beat. And that signal comes here to what's called the sinal atrial node, SA node. And when the signal comes to the SA node, the electricity passes through the muscle of the atria, making the atrium contract or depolarize. And so that signal, 
the, the heart is a three-dimensional muscle, and you have this current going through all of that muscle and making the atria pump, pushing blood from the atria into the ventricles. And so that, that green there, I should have color-coded. Okay, Let's see if I can do that. That's the blue line. Blue. That's not blue. That's blue. So that's making the P wave. The P wave is the depolarization of the atria, the pumping of blood from the atrium into the ventricles. My dad got a pacemaker this summer because his atria stopped functioning basically. <laughs> and so, well, actually it's not just the atria, right? it's a little scary. His heart would skip about one in three beats, sometimes dropping to skipping about every other beat. So you watch the EKG and you have a nice thing like this. And all of a sudden it's just goes again. And the, the spacings were right. It was just missing something. So he has a pacemaker that detects. And if that depolarization doesn't occur, then it's going to send a signal. Now, unfortunately, my dad's pacemaker is an old school one. It doesn't send a signal through the atria. So his atria don't pump when the signal doesn't go from the SA node. So his, his EKG looks funny because it's missing completely that P wave, just flat, because the atria don't pump. Then we have the next step is with my color coordination that was the sa sinal atrial node then we have the av node the atrial ventricular node the av node actually collects the electrical signals and holds it for a little bit and then it sends it on and so the av node sends the signal down through the bundle of hiss you guys should know about the bundle of hiss, right? Somebody has a bundle blockage. It means the electric signal is not going through that bundle of hiss, and that's bad. And hiss, by the way, is spelled H-I-S. And then it goes into the Purkinje fibers, which are like the little igniters in the ventricles to make those contract. So those these little things out here, the Purkinje fibers. And so that is causing the QRS complex the QRS complex is the ventricle depolarizing plus the atria repolarizing. So the atria is returning to action while the ventricle is pumping. That's why you've got that really funky looking thing going on. And then finally you have the T wave. We finished the cycle. The heart has now pumped blood. The first P wave pumped blood into the ventricles. And then the QRS complex pumped blood from the ventricles into the body. So what do you suppose the T wave is? What's left? Okay, we, we've had the P wave, which was the, the atria depolarizing. Then we have the QRS wave that is the ventricles depolarizing and the atria repolarizing. What's left? The ventricles need to repolarize. So the T wave is the ventricle repolarizing. So that's what you should have in a normal sinus rhythm. In my case, besides the fact that I can no longer walk down a hallway without stopping to catch my breath, my brother did an EKG and noticed an inversion of the T wave. My recovery of the ventricles was not going right. And so that is a classic sense um, indicator of not enough oxygen to the heart muscle. And so, you know, my physician just said, oh, doesn't matter. 
But I finally insisted, and we got somebody who, you know, said, you should be dead by now and send me to the hospital. <laughs> um, I'm all better now, though, except for the lungs not working. This here, that's not a very good rhythm, is it? You don't have any systematic behavior. You can have different heart rhythms. You can have a tachycardia. Tachy is Greek for fast. So tachycardia is the heart's beating really fast. You can have VTAC, ventricle um, tachycardia, or ATAC, atrial tachycardia. Those are, are not good, but this here is, is really bad. As my EMT teacher said, not consistent with life. This is fibrillations. This is where the heart is not coordinated. And because it's not coordinated, you're not really pumping anything. You're just kind of quivering. And so if you have something like that going on, like I said, not consistent with life, or my EMT teacher was a very sensitive PC kind of guy, <laughs> circling the drain of life. So if you're in that situation, the goal is to get out of that situation. And so you shock the heart and you stop the heart and you hope that it restarts. Okay, Ryan, because he's the one who knew all of these things. Yeah. <laughs> what part of the EKG is produced by the recovery or repolarization of the ventricles? That's the T wave. That's the T wave. Yes, sir. Now, believe it or not, there is such a thing as a J wave and a U wave. Those are not things that we learned in EMT class. I would have to go look them up again. And the QRS complex, in my mind, they're one thing but you can look them up and see what they are if you're interested. But we can see what's going on with the heart by looking at the electrical signals of how current is passing, how voltage is, yeah, I said current, we haven't learned that word yet. But we look at the voltage differences and charge is gonna flow from more positive to more negative so we can track how charge is moving in the heart. And physicists have spent a lot of time modeling the heart as a 3D instrument and modeling how the electricity goes through the heart. Uh, last thing for today, so I can get you some press, some questions on the homework. The relationship between electric field and potential. If I have a particle that goes from, whoops, from, seriously? Okay. It doesn't like me. It's not drawing anymore. Well, if I have a particle that goes from here to here, what happened to its potential energy? Now, I have to specify. Yeah. A positive or negative charge. That's right. Good answer. Let's say I have a negative charge that goes from here to here. What happened? If it's a negative charge and you're going with the electric field, that's against the force. And so its potential energy increased. That's what you said, right? So its potential energy increased by how much? We've already done the calculation by charge multiplied by voltage difference. Now here's a thing we use a lot. And I can't do it. We use one electron, two electrons, an ion that has a charge of plus one. And so if we do that, change in potential energy is equal to change in voltage multiplied by charge. I say, well, I have a change in voltage of, let's say, 1,000 volts, and I have a charge of one electron. The unit is going to have to be energy. A volt times an electron charge is going to be energy. And so we introduce a unit of energy we call the electron volt, which is one volt, one joule per coulomb, multiplied by one electron charge. That's multiplied by 1.602 times 10 to the minus 19 coulombs. Well, 1 times 1.602 times 10 to the minus 19 coulombs is clearly 1.602 times 10 to the minus 19 joules. So one electron volt is, just take the number for the charge of an electron, it's that many joules. And so we'll calculate the energy difference from a charge moving by just taking the number of electron charges 
you know, one, two, three, four, because that's the fundamental charge, multiply by the voltage difference, and list it in units of electron volts, or EV. And then, because energy is conserved, if the potential energy drops by 1,000 electron volts, as an electron goes through a voltage difference of 1,000 volts, going more positive to make it a drop, then the kinetic energy is going to go up by 1,000 electron volts. Right? Potential energy goes down, kinetic energy goes up. And so I can then calculate speed, because I know the mass of an electron, or the mass of my proton, and kinetic energy is one-half mv squared. So I use those relations, and like I said, I was going to do the math here, but my pin stopped working to show you how it works. We are out of time. Have a great day, and I'll see you all Friday.